here in Philippians chapter 2. We're continuing to look at our joyful fellowship and ministry. In this section, Paul is pointing to two men, Timothy and Epaphroditus, as examples of what it looks like to, to walk faithfully in ministry. And so we're going to continue looking at the life of Timothy this morning. And if you're able to, if you would stand with me as we read Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 19 through 24, as we look at the ministry of Timothy. Paul writes this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come Also, you may be seated. May God be encouraged and glorified through his word this morning. And Father, that is our prayer. Our our prayer is that you would be glorified uh, today. We pray that you would be glorified in the lives of your saints. Uh, We pray that you would open your word to us, convict us, draw us closer to you. Uh, We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I hope this morning that you are someone who wants to do great things for the Lord. You desire to live a life that brings honor to God's name. Now, maybe this morning, uh, you, as you think about yourself, uh, think of yourself as someone with, um, or put it this nicely, uh, someone with a lot of gifts and abilities. Uh, You think of yourself as, as someone who, has, has some talents. You are, you are not only God's gift to women, you are God's gift to the hu- humankind, right? And uh, you wonder, okay, with all these gifts that I have, how can I be effective for the Lord? How can I make my life matter for eternity? And, may, and maybe you're even kind of a little surprised that you haven't been used in more powerful ways. Now, maybe you're a little bit more modest. Uh, you say, boy, I don't have the strengths and, and, and gifts and abilities that I would like to have. But I also would like to be used for God's glory, uh, to proclaim his name, to to do great things of of eternal significance. Now, whether or not you're someone with a lot of gifts this morning or very few gifts and talents, the, the answer is the same for all of us. How can we be used by God to do great things for his name, to do things of eternal significance? The answer is to be faithful, for God to work through us as he causes us to be faithful Here's the main idea that we're looking at this morning and we began looking at last week. Timothy here is an example for us, not because of his spectacular giftedness, but because of his proven faithfulness. Timothy's an example for us, not because of his spectacular giftedness. And as we look at Timothy in Scripture, we don't encounter the people who are talking about Timothy, pointing us to his abilities. They don't talk about how he's this amazing orator, or they don't talk about his administrative talents. They don't talk about how he was, you know, fun at parties. I mean, that's not the things they point to as they talk about Timothy. Now, maybe he was all of those things. I, I believe he did have some gifts and talents, obviously, but Scripture doesn't point us to those as it talks about his ministry. What Scripture tells us about Timothy is that he's faithful, And that's why he serves as an example for us. Like all people we encounter in Scripture who serve as a great cloud of witnesses, the reason we glean from his life is because we can look at a a fellow fallen human being with all the weaknesses that human beings have, and we can see how he proves faithful as he fixes his eyes on Jesus, which is what the writer of Hebrews encourages us to do, isn't it? So remember where we are as we look at Timothy's life. We're going to be talking about the recognized worth of Timothy, and then we're talking uh, not only about his recognized worth, but his selfless heart, and then his proven character. And so let's, let's just do a little bit of review real quickly here, and let's first of all re- remember what we were talking about as we talk about his recognized worth. Look at verse 19, the recognized worth of Timothy. Paul writes this, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon 
so that I too may be cheered by news of you. So apparently what had happened is this. The Philippians had sent Epaphroditus to Paul with a letter. And Epaphroditus had arrived and was talking to Paul there in Rome as Paul's in prison. And the people in Philippi assumed what would happen is that Paul would keep Epaphroditus and he would send Timothy back to Philippi and let them know how Paul was doing. And so Epaphroditus shows up and the people in Philippi were like, hey, where's Timothy? And Epaphroditus is like, well, read the letter. And uh, what Paul is saying is, look, I, I, I need Timothy to stay with me for a little while. You know how valuable Timothy is. I need him. Let me figure out how things go. In the meantime, I've sent Epaphroditus. And we'll begin talking about Epaphroditus next week. And Timothy has value. He has value for both Paul and for the people in Philippi. They, they see his, his worth. Now, as we look at Timothy in Scripture, we see weaknesses. Now, how can someone with such glaring weaknesses at times be someone that's so valuable? Why does everybody want Timothy? And the answer is because he's faithful. In fact, if we, we kind of talked about four things. We, there's more we could have talked about. We, we began talking about four things that Paul tells Timothy as we look at First and Second Timothy in particular, as we look at what Paul tells Timothy and the instructions that he gives him, we, we glean some things about how those of us with weaknesses should understand our ministry. So here's, for example, the four things that Paul told Timothy. One, Paul told Timothy, this is again talking about the recognized worth of Timothy. He says, hey, Timothy, when you're feeling fearful or intimidated, remember. When you're feeling fearful or intimidated, remember. In 1 Corinthians, Paul would say this to the people in Corinth. He says, look, when Timothy comes, put him at ease among you. For he's doing the work of the Lord as I am. Verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 16, let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace. Apparently, the people in Corinth, the first time Timothy had come, had been a little hard on the young guy. And Paul is telling the Corinthians, look, when, when Timothy comes back, I don't, want him to hear, I don't want to hear about how he was intimidated. I don't want to hear about his stomach aching because you guys made his life difficult again, all right? But what he tells Timothy is, look, don't, don't be intimidated. Don't be fearful. God hasn't given us a spirit of timidity, he says in 2 Timothy chapter 1. He tells Timothy to be bold and to remember some things. He tells him to remember the people who've taught him the faith. He tells, he tells, him to, he tells Timothy to remember the people in church leadership who have put their hands on him and said, this is the ministry you're called to. He tells Timothy, most importantly, to remember Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. So don't feel fearful or intimidated, those of you who are weak. Instead, remember, remember Jesus Christ. The second instruction that Paul tells Timothy, when you're in the midst of people who are falling away in a sinful world, persevere. So when you're surrounded by people who are falling away, when you're surrounded by people who are committed to living in a perverse way in a fallen world, don't be like them, persevere. And as we look at First and Second Timothy, we see examples of, of men who are part of Paul's ministry who have fallen away. And that must have been discouraging for Timothy. And Paul says, look, don't be discouraged. Don't, don't be discouraged by those who have swerved, swerved from the faith, 1 Timothy 6, 21. Instead, persevere. Do you ever get discouraged by people falling away? We're discouraged by the, the state of the world in which we live. I saw a story this past week. It, it was about a, a pastor was kind of talking about some things that were going on in his church. And he talked about how he was trying to, to do some advertising for his church. And he, he met with a, a media person about how to do some advertising. And she gave him some suggestions. And one of the suggestions that she gave him was to do something called geofencing. And apparently what this, this is, is according to this, this pastor was talking about, he said, what she told me to do was to um, do this thing where you, you put, av you, you kind of like uh, put geofencing around other churches in the area so that whenever anyone in the church or anyone goes to that church, these other churches, they get advertisements for your church. And he said to the, the person who was telling him, he said, are you, are you, are you kidding me? She goes, no, 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 those people are like built-in givers. They're already giving to these churches, advertise your church when they go there, and, and then when they come to your church, there'll be, there'll be people who are, are giving already. So that, that's crazy. She says, well, there's another church in town doing it. They're doing it to your church. 
I, I read that story and I'm like, that's it. I'm out. The evangelical world has just gone crazy, right? Either that guy's lying and it's a terrible thing to lie about or he's telling the truth and it's a terrible thing. To, like, it just, it's crazy, right? Well, what, is, what does Paul say here? Like, hey, don't, don't be surprised when people do crazy things. Persevere. It's not about people. It's about keeping your eyes fixed on Christ. Third piece of, of counsel Paul gives Timothy is, hey, when you're tempted to engage in foolishness or controversies, instead proclaim, right? When you're tempted to engage in foolish, foolishness or controversies, proclaim. Now, Timothy, maybe he was such a nice guy, he found himself drawn into all sorts of different discussions. Over and over again, First Timothy, Paul warns Timothy, hey, don't argue about this. Don't get involved in this discussion. These things are foolish. Uh, don't, don't be a quarrelsome person. Instead, proclaim. 1 Timothy 4, 7, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know they breed quarrels, and the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. Instead, able to teach. And then one other piece of advice, counsel, that Paul gives Timothy. He says this, when you're in the last days, suffer. When you're in the last days, suffer. Remember we talked about how Paul sent Timothy to Thessalonica to remind them, hey, the reason that you're suffering, we've been destined for this. This is what God has called us to do. And over, over, over again, 2 Timothy 3 and 4, you see this idea. We're in the last days, persevere and suffer. Okay? Now, Timothy had these weaknesses. And these weaknesses is his timidity, his, his youth, uh, his discouragement as people fell away from the faith. These weaknesses meant that, that Paul had to exhort him. But what we see is that Timothy responded to that exhortation, and in his weakness, Christ was made manifest. And he's someone of incredible worth. And so he's of, of such worth, despite these weaknesses, that as, as, as Paul is talking to the people in Philippi, he has to explain why he's not sending Timothy to them. He's a man of incredible, of incredible worth, not because of himself, but because of Christ's work in his life. That should be really encouraging to us. Maybe you're someone who, who struggles uh, with your, your weaknesses, uh, feeling inadequate. I was talking with the, the guys in my care group on Friday night, and we're, we were talking about uh, di- you know, just different things, and we were talking about how, uh, you know, the, my, my favorite, as you know, my, my favorite TV show is uh, kids' cartoon Bluey, and how the, there's a cartoon dog that's a better dad than me in many ways, right? That's discouraging sometimes. Well, persevere, right? It's God who's made manifest in our weaknesses. And he made Timothy, who he was, weaknesses and all, worthy. He's, Timothy is Philippians 2.13 in action, right? It's God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Here's an example, Timothy. Okay, that's the recognized world. Let's talk about the selfless heart of Timothy. Look at verses 20 and 21. Paul says, I have no one like him, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Now, Timothy is a unique partner for Paul. He says, I have no one like him. And what does Paul prize about him? Well, it's not his ability to skillfully win an argument. Paul Paul says the, the first thing that he values about his young friend Timothy is that he is genuinely concerned for your welfare. That's that's foundational. Anything that Anything else that is true of Timothy builds upon that foundation of of caring about the people that he's ministering to. What a remarkable thing to say about a person. I have no one like him. He's he's incredibly unique. It is unique because he has these amazing skills at at helping. No, no, he's, he's amazing because he cares about the interests of others. In fact, no one is like him in their care for other people. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing to hear people say about you? Oh, that per- what an amazing Sunday school teacher she is. No one cares about those kids like she does. I was talking with uh, someone recently about their pastor. And he said that a couple many years ago had visited their church. They'd visited several other churches in the area. And they, they, visited, they visited this church. And this couple 
saw the senior pastor serving in kind of this, this quiet ministry. And they said, you know what? He's, he's serving behind the, the scenes there. No one knows that he's doing that. This is the church for us because they have a senior pastor who serves. And they've been here at Bethany Community Church ever since. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we were probably one of the churches they visited and then was the other one, right? No, it wasn't Bethany. But, but what a great thing to say about your pastor, right? Or about your Sunday school teacher, or about your mom, or about whoever it is, right, that's serving them. They, they genuinely care about the needs of other people. Paul says, I, I have no one like him. He's in a class by himself. Why is he in a class by himself? Well, because, look at the, again at the text, he says he's, he's genuine. He's, he's genuinely concerned. That word genuine means, means truly, it means real. Some of you were alive in the, the mid-1980s, and I can remember being a, a kid in the mid-1980s, and one of the first things I was aware of in the culture was this thing called New Coca-Cola. It's been called the greatest marketing blunder in history by Coca-Cola. That's what they call it, right? And, and New Coke was supposed to be this, 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 this drink that was even better than the original Coke, and they they, they brought it out to this massive fanfare. There's all this research that showed that in blind taste tests, it was the best tasting drink and blah, 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 blah. The problem was this. Coca-Cola had spent literally 100 years talking about how it was the real thing, the original formula, and how it was the, the, original, the original Coca-Cola. And so people were furious. Uh, my family wasn't furious. We were drinking generic Coca-Cola anyway, but... A lot of people were furious, right? And so they, they backtracked and said, okay, you know, Coca-Cola classic, it's, it's the, the real thing. Nothing like the real thing, baby. That was one of the advertising jingles. Uh, Timothy is Coca-Cola classic. He's genuine. He's the real thing. There's nothing better than the real thing. Now, why is he genuine? Well, look at what else it says. It says, Paul is truly concerned for your welfare. That, that word that Paul uses there for concerned can be used positively or negatively. Later in the, in the epistle, it's going to be used negatively. It's going to be translated, that word is, as anxious. He says, be anxious for nothing. But here it's used positively. It's, it's used and translated concerned. What it means is it's, it's talking about what the mind thinks about. So when a person is concerned about something, they're, they're thinking about it. Paul uh, is, is saying that Timothy is concerned for them. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, uses this word. He says, don't be anxious about your life, in Matthew chapter 6, what you'll eat, what you'll drink. Don't be anxious about your body, what you'll put on. So again, it's, it's what the mind is, is thinking about, concerned about. He uses it several times there in Matthew 6. It's a word that's used to describe Martha. Remember, Martha is is, is serving, and she tells Jesus to tell her sister to help her. And in Luke chapter 10, Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious. That's the same word. You're troubled about many things. It's also a word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians. Listen to how Paul uses this word in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, I want you to be free from anxieties. That's that same word. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord. He's concerned. He's thinking about those things, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious, there's that word, about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. The unmarried man or a betrothed woman is anxious, anxious, thinking about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. So it's, it's, it's what you're thinking about. Here it's used positively. Just like a husband is thinking about his wife. Or a wife is, is anxious and concerned for her husband. Timothy is, is thinking about them. This word describes what your mind is, is meditated on is, on, is distracted by. I have this uh, app on my phone called Todoist. Maybe some of you are Todoist users as well. And we can talk later about what a great app it, it is. But I, I use that thing all the time. All the time. It, in fact, if you talk to me this morning and you say, hey, Daniel, will you please pray for this? And I, I, I pull this out of my pocket. I carry you know, the phone around with me and make sure I grab it here. And, and as I'm walking around, and say, so hey, Daniel, will you pray for this? And you, you see me pull out my phone. It's not because you're boring me, okay? 
and I'm checking Facebook or something. I'm, I'm writing down what you're telling me to pray for on to do list, and you know, tomorrow I'll look at those things. And I, if I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and think about something, open up to do list and write it down. Next morning I'll look at it. It makes no sense, but it's what my mind was thinking about. Right now I'm working on a, a, a couple house projects, and, and I'll, you know, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I'm, I'm typing up some of those things. I'm, every time uh, I, I'm thinking, I did this a couple times yesterday, did it this morning, I think about something for a, for a future sermon or a future message. I'm, I'm writing it down to do this and later transferring it to Notion, another great app. This, this morning's sermon is brought to you by Apple products, right? <laughs> I'm thinking about those things. If you open up my to-do list, you see what I'm anxious about. You see what I'm concerned about. Timothy, for, for Timothy, the, the people of God are on his to do He's He's mindful of them. There's a laser-like attention to the needs of others to whom he's ministering. When Paul sends Timothy to Thessalonica, when he, he sends him to Corinth or, or Ephesus, he knows that Timothy is going to be mindful. Look, look what else it says of them. Look what else it says. It says, uh, I have no one like him who's going to be genuinely concerned for your welfare. And then he uses a little bit of hyperbole here in verse 21. He says, they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Now, all, he's not talking about all the people that are with him, but, but he's talking about these people as, as a whole, some of those perhaps that we saw earlier in the, the, the epistle who are seeking their own interests, they're seeking their own interests, not those of Christ. Now, what does it look like to be motivated by self-interest? That's a characteristic not of a true minister of Christ, but of a false minister. In fact, keep your finger there in Philippians. Turn over to 2 Peter. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2 and, and listen to what we read here about false prophets if self-interest marks your ministry, that's a problem. Listen to what we, we read in 2 Peter chapter 2. Peter says, false prophets, this is 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1, false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. Now, go down to verse 10. He says, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passions and despise authority, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Verse 12, these like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be dis destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime, their blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Now, a couple things stand out here about these who are motivated by self-interest. And as we look at these, it's important not only to, to understand what a false teacher looks like out there, but to examine our own hearts and say, am I, do I have the same selfless heart that Timothy has? A couple things. We see that their selfishness, their self-interestedness is revealed by sexual immorality. They, they made an Id idolatry of licentiousness and perversion. Instead of fighting the flesh, they, they pursue fleshly pleasure. We see their selfishness revealed by a, a casualness towards spiritual things. They're, they're involved in, in the life of the church. They're around spiritual things, but they treat it as very common. They, they, they come into the worship service, and, and everyone else is, is praising God, and maybe they're, they're kind of going through the motions, and yet there's no sense of reverence as they come before a holy God. As they talk about spiritual things, there's a, a casualness and a flippancy. There's self-interestedness and selfishness that's revealed by sin with, with money and with greed. You see people in the church not as people to, to serve, but as tools to be used to serve them. 
how can you tell? How can you tell if someone's going to go the distance in ministry? It's not by listening to them, but it's by watching them, isn't it? In other words, you see a woman, you say, I don't know if she's going to go the distance in the ministry that God's called her to. It's not by listening to her teach her to be real. It's, it's by watching her serve. You see a man says, is that guy going to, going to be faithful? Well, you don't just listen to him speak at a men's breakfast. You watch him serve. Especially when they think that no one else is watching. You think about just kind of walking around here at church. There, there are all sorts of things that I have no idea how they get done at this church. <laughs> just walk around and say, well, that's nice. I wonder who did that. Someone quietly with a selfless heart just trying to care for the people at the church. I don't know if I mentioned this before. Maybe I mentioned this before. If I, if I do, you can just tune out for a second. At my house, we have, and I don't mean to brag, um, but we have like a, a magic countertop in the bathroom of, of our house. I can put an empty tube of toothpaste there, and in 24 hours, a brand new tube of toothpaste shows up. I'm not kidding you. I don't know where it comes from. I don't know how it gets there, but somehow it magically, or old toothbrush, I just put there, and a new toothbrush shows up. It's, it's phenomenal. I have a clue. I think I have a selfless wife who notices a need and then meets it, right? How can I know if my motivation is right? Well, a person who's motivated to pursue Christ's interests is a person whose ministry is going to go the distance. Paul would say this in 1 Corinthians 10, let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor. He'd say this in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, love does not insist on its own way. A person who's going to go the distance in ministry has a selfless heart. They're gospel focused. They're willing to give up their rights. Here's, here's a thought experiment. How cool would it be to be in church with Timothy? How cool would it be to be in a small group with Timothy? What would a conversation with him be like? He'd be a person who, who listens that doesn't talk all the time. He'd be a person who, who sees a need and, and meets it. What would it be like as a pastor? That'd be a pretty cool pastor. I'd like to have Timothy as a pastor. That's what I aspire to be in my own pastoral ministry. What would it be like to have Timothy as a best friend or a co-worker? We want to emulate Timothy not because he had weaknesses, but because he was faithful. Paul trusted Christ, not Timothy, as he saw evidence of Christ working through Timothy. And I imagine Timothy, as he struggled with not being liked, as he struggled with saying hard things, as he struggled perhaps with some of the sins of youth, I can imagine him being discouraged, and yet Paul sends him to Corinth and Thessalonica. He sends him to Philippi. Why? Because he knew that Timothy loved the people that he was sending him to, and that he had a selfless heart. And even though it was going to be hard for Timothy to say hard things to the people in Philippi, he was willing to do so because he had a selfless heart, and he loved them. Maybe you'd say this morning, I want to make an eternal difference in the lives of others. What, what should I focus on first? What, I, I, I want to I wanna be a tool that God uses to bring about eternal change in someone's life. What do I need to do? If you're asking me this morning, Daniel, do I need to work on understanding the Bible more? Do I need to, to work on uh, my, my teaching ability? Do I need to work on my, my understanding of how to exegete a passage? And I would say, yeah, you do need to do those things. But foundationally, before you do anything else, not only do you need to cultivate a love for God, but foundationally, you must have a love for other people. If you do not love the people that God has placed in your life, you are not prepared to make an eternal difference. It begins by loving others. There can be no effective Christ-like ministry. There can be no effective Christ-exalting, God-glorifying, eternal fruit-bearing ministry without selfless ministry. Listen to what Ray Ortland writes, or what, what he said. Ray Ortland's a pastor, older pastor. Listen to what he says. He says, when I, when I plant, and what he says about pastoral ministry is true for all ministry. He says, when I planted a church in the 1980s, I properly revered the ministry of preaching, but I undervalued the ministry 
of pastoring. I actually believe preaching would do everything. He says, preaching is meant to be a glorious gospel voice, but within a larger relational context. And he talks about the example of Paul. He says, the humanity of Paul, his tenderness, his heart, his relational yearning pours out in his letters. And it's that pastoral, emotional, relational context with which, within which preaching really resonates. And that's true in pastoral ministry, and it is true in whatever ministry that God has called you to You say, well, Daniel, I don't have a ministry. And I say, yes, you do. You say, well, I don't know what it is. And I say, well, look, I I mean this in the kindest possible way, but I just need to get on the next point, so I'm going to be blunt here. Uh, You don't know what your ministry is because you're selfish. (laughs) And, And you're so focused on yourself, you can't see the needs of everyone else around you. And I can say that bluntly and clearly to you because I struggle with the same thing. Here's Timothy. He's sensitive to needs of others. His weakness can make him timid, but the strength is when he says, look, I love these people so much, I'm going to tell you the hard things. I'm going to be anxious for your needs. Oh, brothers and sisters, how I aspire to this strength that Timothy has here. Let's move on to the proven character. The proven character of Timothy. There's something we, we see here about Timothy. Timothy. He says in verse 22, Paul Paul says in verse 22, again, he's talking to the people in Philippi. He says, you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. Timothy has proven his character. It says proven worth, that, that word that he uses here for, for proven is, is defined as a proof of character oftentimes in Scripture. This proven character isn't something that, that Timothy demanded, but it's something that he earned. And Paul looks at Timothy and he sees him faithful year after year after year, journey after journey after journey. And, and Paul says, this is my guy. I was talking about uh, Timothy with, with, in this passage with Kirk Hoffman, and, and Kirk, Kirk pointed out something, something to me. He says, you know, it's interesting that Paul says this about Timothy because we know how he felt about John Mark at one point in John Mark's ministry. And I said, oh, that's good. Pulled my to-do list. I had that, right? It's true. Paul values those who've proven their character, and John Mark has to prove his character before Paul understands his value again. Timothy's worth, however, is proven again and again and again. How is it proved? It says he's, like a, he's been like a son with a father, honoring me and serving me uh, for the purpose of gospel proclamation. In fact, Paul says he's so valuable to me that I can't send him right now. Uh, let me see how things shape out here with my ministry, and, and then I'll send him. By the way, I hope myself to see you soon. We see his wisdom here. He's trying to avoid miscommunication. He's about to tell him how great Epaphroditus is in just a moment. Do you want to maximize your effectiveness for the kingdom of God? Again, I I hope you do. If so, don't worry so much about other people seeing and validating your gifts. Don't worry so much about people patting you on the back and seeing your your worth. Instead, worry about demonstrating your character. It's not wrong to want recognition. It's not wrong to want respect. But often, we want respect in other people's lives that we haven't yet earned. Two thoughts here to mull over that that I find helpful in in my pastoral ministry. I find helpful in my parenting. I find it helpful as I speak in other people's lives. Here's two thoughts. Number one, talents plus titles don't equal trust. Talent plus title does not equal trust. 
You say, well, I have, the, I have the title of parent. I have the title of pastor. I have the title of ministry coordinator. I have the, the title of Sunday school teacher or deacon or whatever the title is. Why don't people trust me? Well, because title doesn't equal trust. Ah, but I have a title plus talent. Eh, who cares? That doesn't earn trust. Just because you give good advice doesn't mean that people are required to take it. And oftentimes, you just, I'm so talented, I've got this ministry, and why don't people see it? I'm a, I'm a parent, why don't my kids see it? Talent plus title doesn't earn or equal trust yet. Secondly, here's a hard one. Time plus testing does equal trust. Time plus testing equals trust. The first thing here is time. Proving your character takes a very, very, very long time, especially for some people. For some people, you're in their life, and they've, they've been around people like you before. They've been around Sunday school teachers who say some of the exact same words that you do, and they've really let them down. And so you can say the same things, but they've been here before. In fact, maybe you're the person that let them down before. Time plus testing equals trust. So be patient. Be faithful. It takes time. Don't go for the quick, easy ministry. That's not going to bear eternal fruit. But I said time plus testing. Well, what does testing mean? It means that one of the ways that you're going to gain credibility in other people's lives is by a means you may not be all that excited about. One of the ways that you are going to gain trust in your ministry is through suffering. And suffering well. Paul would use the same word in Romans chapter 5. He says this in verse 1. He says, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we've also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So here, here's the gospel, and maybe you're, you're here this morning, you're not a believer. Here's what Paul's saying. Look, we've been, we've been justified, we've been declared righteous by God through faith. So in other words, we recognize that we're sinners, we've recognized we can't save ourselves, and that apart from God divinely intervening, we are headed for hell. And so what has happened? We have recognized that Jesus Christ came and lived the perfect life for us and took our penalty by dying on the cross. Jesus Christ, who is fully God and fully man, has taken our penalty for us. And now we've, we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ and we've been justified, we've been declared righteous by God by God's grace, through our, our faith, through trusting in him alone. That, that's where we stand. And now everything is great, and there's no more problems. No, wait, that's not what the text says. He says we rejoice currently as we think about who we are in Christ right now. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That's, that's the nature, that's the purpose of our ministry. We want to serve with a selfless heart the people around us so they can know Jesus Christ. The, the greatest ambition we have, and we've seen this over and over again in the book of Philippians, we want people to glorify God. And so what they need to do is they need to see that, that hope of the gospel being lived out in us. And Paul says this is what happens. He says, uh, not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Why? Because we know that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. That's that word that's used here in Philippians as well, this idea of character. It's proven character. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out, uh, poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You are proving your character as you demonstrate your belief in the gospel. Now, proven character doesn't mean perfer perfected character. We recognize that we still need the gospel. We're still going to, to fail. That's why we point people to Christ's finished work, not our own. But part of, part of our ministry and others is proven character through suffering. Time plus 
testing equals trust. And perhaps the struggle that you're going through right now is the part of the means that God is using to allow you to be more effective in your ministry to others. Be patient. We're not in ministry for the short term, but the the long haul. Timothy. Timothy here is an example for us, not because of his spectacular giftedness, but because of his proven faithfulness. And there are people in this church, perhaps as you think about the people in your life, who've, who've proven their love for you. It encourages you. Timothy is this kind of leader. If Timothy were to come to you and say, look, Daniel, I need you to persevere in suffering. I hope I would say, yeah, Timothy, I believe you. <laughs> You've shown me what it looks like. I, I've seen you. I've seen you love me. I've seen you do hard things, and so I can accept the hard things you're telling me to do. So I exhort you this morning to let Timothy be an example for you. I let Timothy be an example not because of his spectacular giftedness, but because of his proven faithfulness. Let's emulate Timothy not because of his weaknesses, but because of the strengths of Christ worked out through his faithfulness despite his weaknesses. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we prepare our hearts to partake of your supper, we're mindful of the the ministry of Timothy. We pray that you would strengthen us. You would give us not a a spirit of timidity, but but power and discipline through the work of your spirit. We're weak. We're weak in terms of our ability to persevere. We're weak not not only in our ability to persevere, but even in our desire to persevere. Strengthen us the work of your son Jesus this morning. We pray in his name.